am delighted that next up we are going to be talking about seeing sustainability in action. And here in South London, I'm very proud to say that we're about to hand over to Mark, who is at the Remakery. Mark, hoping you're going to be telling us a little bit about the Remakery and the incredible work that you do in terms of sustainability in the workspace and with a discussion with entrepreneurs over there. So Mark, from South London, back over across to South London, over to you. Good morning. Um, my name is Mark Bovenden. I am one of the founding directors of Remakery Brixton Limited, otherwise known as the Remakery. Um, we have a very large um, uh, space in, in South London, in SE5. Uh, it's about almost a thousand square meters uh, of, a, of space that used to be a car park um, underneath the residential block of flats. Um, we, the business was established in 2012 and um, a team of people took the building uh, with um, support from the council and we slowly, very slowly um, developed the building over a period of a number of years. Um, really, the building is still in some respects work in progress. Um, there's very little heating and um, other things yet to, um, to come into fruition. Um, the space is uh, providing opportunities for local people to make, co-work. Um, there's a fantastic space here that I think everybody feels is quite kind of homely. Um, it's a, a, an inspiring place, I think, for everybody involved, really. And um, we have been able, with um, the support and help from Lambeth Council, to keep rents low here, to make the, the opportunities for people to set up their businesses possible. And over um, the years going forwards and Looking back at all the exciting projects that we run here, we hope that this space will allow more businesses to set up and for more exciting opportunities for people to take place. But that, all of that is only possible, um, I would say, with, a, with continued support, um, certainly from the council and um, businesses and, and other ways that we can kind of link up and create partnerships with different, different organizations and spaces. Um, I'm going to uh, move around and introduce three um, really valuable, really interesting businesses that have established themselves here. And they're gonna introduce a little bit about their, their project and what's going on with their projects. And, um, and then we're gonna have a, a bit of a general chat. And we've also got somebody in the chat who is um, one of our previous directors who is gonna feed some questions through to us. Um, so I think without further ado, further ado, I will get on with um, introducing the other, the other uh, businesses. And um, please do uh, feed some interesting things into the chat and then that way those questions can get back to uh, these uh, businesses and myself. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna introduce you now Dennis, who is from In Use Reuse. Dennis, please uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Dennis um, Boltank. I run an organization called In Use Reuse, which was founded in 2018 due to a local need. Um, so um, I used to work at an organization called GLL, which was a leisure center. And via my commutes, I used to um, go through Brixton Market and notice um, discarded pallets being thrown into the dust carts, which is the main big trucks that are collected for the general waste within which the market. Um, I realized that there was an issue with um, um, the fact that these pallets were just getting thrown away. So I contacted the council. I didn't get a response from the council initially, Lambeth Council. So um, I contacted an organization called Bricks and Bids, which is um, um, the business improvement district, which support local enterprise within Lambeth for itself. The gentleman over there managed to get me a meeting with um, the head of the environmental department. And from there, 
um, we were able to kick off a, a, a pilot scheme and we haven't turned our back since. Um, so we've been trading from that period for three years now. During that period, um, I also reached out to Romakery. Um, I'm a local resident. Um, I found Romakery online, I found that they had a workshop and um, I asked if it was possible to get a, a, a space within this particular location. I was very fortunate to have, have received that. And yeah, the rest is history. Um, from my background, I had no experience in, a, in and around sustainability, in and around woodworking, in and around carpentry. And I've learned that process as I've gone along since 2019. And without a space like the Remakery, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. So I'm grateful for the space itself. I'm grateful that I'm grateful for the fact that there's spaces like this within London that give um, young entrepreneurs that opportunity to um, explore their ideas. And yeah, so we are an upcycling, recycling organization kicking off from 2018. Through that time, I've actually physically picked up over 12,000 pallets. Um, we've upcycled 547 pallets into furniture and we've um, recycled over 20 tons of wood waste. On average, between four to 500 pallets a month gets accumulated within the market. And then I have to send over the reports over to Lambeth Council. We're looking at um, continuing this process, working on outdoor projects, um, indoor projects, and yeah, just continuing that, 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 that reign of sustainability. Something also important to me is the social value that it adds as well. I've been able to, to get people on board that weren't employed. Um, during COVID, in particular my cousin that lives down the road, um, within Lambeth Borough, and um, that's important to me, getting um, young local people um, involved in woodworking, in recycling, in upcycling. So that's been an important factor for me and, and within my journey. And I just like to say, I'm, I'm so grateful for having a space like the Remaker to allow me to even execute such a thing. So that's my background. I hope I've, I've been able to explain it well. And um, I feel like we'll kick on to the, the next um, um, individual within the space. Um, so now I'm going to introduce Phil, who is from Upcycle London. Cheers, mate. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, my name is Phil Dodson. I'm founder of Upcycle. Uh, basically, I established it in June last year as a way of um, tackling young people, young people who are having to go on public transport, and um, obviously what, everything that was happening with COVID, it wasn't a very safe space. So I thought instead of them using public transport, they can use bikes to get around London, going to school, looking after members of the family. Um, so what we do is we take secondhand bikes and fix them up. Initially, I was doing it out of my flat in um, Clapham Junction. So I had you know, about six, seven bikes in the flat and more locked up outside. And I don't have any outdoor space. So I was just fixing them up either in the flat or in the little area outside, which isn't ideal. Um, so I thought I'd need to get out into a proper space, and that's how I found out about the remakery. Um, and it's just a perfect sort of space to sort of uh, meet other like-minded people. And also just the connections have been really great with the council. It's led to um, funding, which means that we can have a greater impact on uh, the young people that we work with. Uh, so basically what we do with the remaker, we, we run bike repair workshops. So we get a group of young people in and we'll have a qualified mechanics show them how to do basic bike repair, such as changing brake pads and inner tubes, that kind of thing. Um, and after a few sessions working on the bike, young people get to keep the bike they've been working on. So it's an incentive for them to keep coming back. It's also a great way of giving them skills that they're going to need to look after the bike and keep on using it once they've got it. Um, and it means that if anything goes wrong, instead of it being chucked onto landfill, they can keep it running and they don't have to go out and buy a new one. Um, going forward, we are sort of planning on running more workshops uh, here at the Remakery. Also, we want to start um, running cycle skill sessions. So as well as giving them the bike, we'll go out of them on group rides. Um, this is we're going to help them gain confidence on the roads. And again, it means that they're more likely to carry on riding. Um, but it's all about sort of, you know, creating these behavioral changes where if you can get a young person into cycling, 
um, whilst they're still sort of at school, they're more likely to carry it on when they sort of leave school, go to college or work. And instead of using a car or public transport or getting a lift off someone, they're going to carry on using their bike. And just small changes like this is going to help towards um, climate change and basically meaning that more people are active as well is, um, is a great way of getting around London. And, and um, yeah, that's it for me. I'm now going to introduce Michelle, who's from Monthsley. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Michelle Osborne Mathiasen, and I am the owner of an independent sewing company called Monso, the sewing company. Uh, I started uh, my company in 2016. Having had my son, um, I just found it so difficult to balance up working for a large charity. Um, at head office and having the quality of life I needed for my son. Um, so I fell back on my, my God-given skill, which is sewing, and created Mumso the Sewing Company. Um, I created it with a difference. Um, I wanted to, I don't want to, I didn't want to create thousands of items to just go out there. I wanted to create unique pieces, meet amazing people and impart some of my skills onto other people, not necessarily sewing, but how to repair and remake and reuse things that they have. Um, the company, as I say, has been running from since 2016. We offer a full range of services, which is bespoke, uh, bespoke tailoring, bespoke dressmaking, mending, reusing, refashioning, and my favorite, which is remodeling. Um, we even do upholstery and soft furnishings. I think the difference between my company and other companies out there is that we tr I try to approach the problem of, of, of us just using too much and having too much and then throwing it away. My mum always taught me to buy good quality things and they will last you forever. You just have to repair it. And that's my ethos when people come in. You know, I encourage them to reuse and remake. We have um, a lovely teacher who wanted to improve the efficiency of her classroom. So she came to Monso and asked um, if I could make chair pockets, uh, whereby the children put their books in the back of a pocket on the back of their chair. Um, we looked at all the different options and we came down to the fact that we've got so much upholstery fabric and she had an old curtain. Um, she had about oof, a good four, five meters. And instead of buying new fabric from, you know, a, a shop, a haberdashery store, we reuse the curtain. And so, you know, that's reusing something that would otherwise not have been used. And it's, you know, it's been brought into a classroom to the next generation. And there's provenance to it. There's a history and they understand that this is a purpose. It had a life before and this is, um, what it's been used for now. Uh, the Remakery has offered me the greatest platform to launch from. I started from my front room um, and I moved from the front room to here and I've gone from small space to double space. I have two lovely ladies that come, girls actually, who are otherwise unemployed, who come and work for, for Mumso, the sewing company. And I'm imparting all of my skill and my 40 years of knowledge onto them. And so they're learning skills and they're also learning the basics of reusing and recycling. And that's the onus on all of the projects that we take on at, at Mumso, the sewing company. And also I get to share this amazing recycling, reuse, remaking with amazing, brilliant minded people, artists and innovators. So it's a positive, place to be. Um, I'm just going to quickly pick up on a few a few points and uh, start looking at some of the issues that we face here, challenges and um, and also some of the aspects more broadly about sustainability and the arts. Um, and so one of the first things I was going to pick up on is one of the challenges. And I'm just gonna ask Dennis if he could address uh, a point about the difficulties because 
um, a lot of people think that there's um, that things that should be done cheaply. If you are talking about making with old um, materials, that things can be cheaper. And um, I think um, Dennis has got some good insight into this about um, the complications and challenges that we face in a space like this, and how it shouldn't be undermined um, the, the the work. Um, so Dennis, maybe you could touch on this point for me. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, um, through the journey, we've noticed that um, um, in regards to reusing materials, um, there's a process to it. Um, it, it, it it's, a, it's a more of a long-winded process in regards to buying um, new stock material. And then that, that has to be accounted for in um, labor costs. Um, it's, it's, in, to give an example, making use of pallets, we have to dismantle the pallets, we have to take out all the nails, we have to make sure the, the actual plants are straight to be re um, reused, it has to be cleaned, sanded, sanded um, to get it to up to, to up to a level which allows us to, to make use of it for the reuse of furniture. So through the process of going through that, we've learned that we have to allocate more, more um, What's it called costing to the labor side of things. And um, when we um, send over quotes or prices, it, it seems to be um, people are quite surprised about the price. But we have to, um, I think it's an educational thing in regards to getting people to understand that there is um, a lot of work that needs to go into it to allow it to be up to a certain standard to be um, redistributed or resold to in the market. So that's my experience. and. It's something that I feel like over time people would understand more once you're, you know, exposed to it more. So. I'm going to pass over to Michelle now and uh, just ask a little more about um, just generally about the arts and the responsibility to contribute to that in a way. Um, how how can we think about um, the role of the arts to um, to address climate change and and you know we, we we're all working here in our own separate fields and um you know there are makers here um who work with um old equipment there are workers there are makers who work with um with metal um we have a a maker that um uh, well, we have we have other people who work here uh, doing things like growing mushrooms from old coffee grounds and um, someone trying to produce glues that are really natural glues. All of these projects are really kind of, some of them are, are quite complex and all working with these old materials and the challenges involved are both kind of fantastic and at the same time, uh, labor intensive and I think one of the interesting things is how we as a um, as a group of people try to kind of address those points and try to um, understand our role uh, more broadly in this in this, um, this this bigger picture so I'm going to hand over to Michelle and ask ask her the point like what is the role of the arts in um, in this um, this 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 uh, fight against climate change. Hi, hi. Uh, so one of the things I realised when I started Monso is uh, there has to be a distinction between, in regards to the arts and fashion. So that's how I relate it together. Um, uh, there uh, was the distinction between fast fashion and sustainable fashion. And I think it's at the foreground at the moment, but certainly when I started, it would have people who would shop at, you know, that very well-known huge branch that will sell t-shirts for two pounds. And you'd have people that would shop at um, more expensive outlets. Um, that distinction had to be made. Um, and that was one of the starting points. Now, in my experience and what I see of the fashion industry, it's, it's, a, it's a massively creative industry and it's full of amazing artists but they use a lot of materials, lots and lots of materials. 
more than we know. That goes from everything to do with displays and draping and advertising. And for the most part, these materials are one use materials. So they are used for an exhibition or for a show. And after the show's wrapped up, these items are discarded. And we're talking about a whole array of materials from plywood through to fabrics. Now, this has to be something that's considered across the fashion industry. We need to understand that the materials we use have to be calculated and we need to work out the end life for these products. And if we actually need to use these, I mean, a simple solution when we have fabrics that are draped up on walls, say, for instance, instead of using different fabrics, we could use one white uh, light uh, contact fabric. Yeah, so what happens with upcycle? People donate um, their bikes that they're not using anymore, usually, and it was a case of we'll assess it and make carry out any repairs to it. So at the start, I was just taking like any bike that was coming to me. So we had ones that have been left outside for years and it's all rusted and everything. It turns out that by the time you change everything on it, it it's, doesn't really have any value. So we had to find a way of basically quite taking all the parts off it that we could use and then um, respond to the recycling and the rest of it. So we partnered up, part, part, can't say we teamed up with a, with a uh, recycling company down the road and they every now and again, they'll come down and they'll collect any um, bikes that we're not using. And there's, there's plenty of waste from the, the repairs that we carry out. So, you know, we always change the inner tubes and cables and brake pads on it. And all of that has to be um, responsibly recycled as well. Um, we At the moment, we have about 30, 40 bikes in storage that need to be fixed. And plenty of them will, will not be, that, that won't be possible. But we, what we can do is take parts of bikes that can't be fixed and use it to fix a, a different bike. So we sort of, I guess it's like cannibalize a different a bike and turn turn one in to turn one another bike into one that can be used. Um, yeah, so. um, and I'm going to ask more broadly a question for all of us. Um, uh, how how can we work together as a society? Uh, and I'm kind of particularly thinking about how we um, work um, like it, our local community, because one of the things that um, one of the things that's um, a, a kind of real situation for people here, I guess, is uh, trying to kind of address the issue of climate change um, with reduced finances with um, uh, people who already have um, jobs having to kind of work hard locally and um, trying to make ends meet and I guess in a way there's there's a big um, question there is that it's kind of a huge question because it kind of goes right back to the responsibility of the state um, uh, how much responsibility the state has to address um, the fight against climate change. Uh, how is it an individual's responsibility? Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, how we, we kind of work together um, at, at spaces like this, but also uh, trying to help small, other kind of small businesses to develop um and, and come up with with other solutions so um i don't know if we if anyone's got any um kind of points to pick up on on that specifically about the state responsibility or um how we can kind of work together locally yeah i think um you know in as individuals we can do what we what we can and make small changes to what we do in daily life, whether it's you know cycling around or the kind of food consumed, but I think on a bigger scale, it's up to the state to 
uh, make the changes and, and see what's happening now with COP26 of sort of bringing in these um, you know initiatives and laws and rules and but it's, it's whether people actually follow through with it um, and it's it's that it's up to them to lead by example you know it's, it's no good people making these small changes if, if our sort of if state that governments aren't also doing it on um, a bigger scale. I think, um, you know, on a really basic level, the initiative that was brought about uh, regarding the use of uh, single-use plastic bags, the impact was huge. And that wasn't done at ground level, that was implemented at the top level. And so I think, you know, it's, it's an, we have equal, we have an equal share and equal responsibility in this, but we can only, you know, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And the biggest link in all of this is, the, is our state. They will implement policies. They will influence larger corporations. You know, like my son and I were discussing it the other day. Why do we need to buy water bottles of Evian? Why isn't there just a huge tank whereby we can just fill up our one, us, um, you know, use our personal bottles? I mean, these are really simple ideas, but again, that would take someone on the ground level having these ideas and working alongside the state so then just giving them fresh ideas. I mean, that's how we're going to have to work together. I don't know whether it's a case of them and us. It just has to be all of us, but we all need to take an equal share in it. Okay, thanks. And um, and um, I'm going to... I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other um, businesses in the space and um, one or two other kind of things that um, we've got going on here, you know, to give some other examples of um, how this space has kind of worked. I mean, clearly over a longer period of time, the, um, there's been lots of involvement from lots of different kinds of organisations, lots of different kinds of projects. And I think in a way, for me personally, it's been a, a really like huge learning curve just trying to work with lots of different individuals and understand their you know, individual needs, but also trying to think um, how, how we all work together, you know, and, um, and I think, you know, this whole area is, is huge in terms of um, the kinds of um, the kinds of a, a, a impact that we have to have across a, such a broad range of, of um, conversations. Uh, we've been loosely involved in the um, local. Um, uh, yeah, there's the Lambert set up a, a um, um, part of a, a, the, the climate change. Um, um there, there was a, a group that met up to discuss points that came out of the um uh, climate a, a climate conference um which came out of extinction rebellion demands and um there was a lot of talk at that about um all the different areas that we had to focus on transport energy and when you think on a kind of local level all of the demands that would be, all, all of the, the results that came out of this conversation. Um, when you look at individual responsibilities across those areas, some of them are quite complex and uh, difficult to, to deal with. And like certainly in terms of um, uh, looking at a space like this and everybody kind of, when you speak to people who come into this space, they feel very inspired. And often I think there's, a, a somewhat of a disparity between what people feel needs to be achieved and what they can do themselves. And I think, you know, really like people are very capable of looking, of looking at where their skills lie and saying, okay, this is what I can do. And then if you look at that specific project or task or whatever, look at your core skills and then say, okay, this is how my project or business can develop over a period of time. And I think that's the thing that I've seen a lot here, really kind of fantastic people just saying, 
these are my skills. This is how I can move these skills forward and make it more sustainable. And here are, I think, are really three really good um, and interesting projects that have um, that have shown uh, how these um, these ideas can can move forward. I'm just having a little look at the chat box now. Um, and seeing if we can maybe answer one or two questions that have come in. <clears throat> um, we've got something from Anika here that says, I intend to create my own business where I would like to sell gift merchandise alike. What advice does the Remakery have for me as someone who is new to the game? So, um, this is somebody who's selling gifts uh, and merchandise. We don't have specific information about the gifts, but I think, um, I mean, the first thing, like I would, I, I'd like to kind of start on is one of the things that we've tried to kind of think about here are skills in the building, materials associated with those skills, and then um, trying to kind of bring things together. So wood was the first thing that started in this space it was just such an obvious win uh we were collecting bits of wood but before uh, even like there were lots of materials here in the early days uh, the whole place was full of junk at one point and i think really it was the point when we realized okay these are the skills this is how we marry these things up and the point i'm just getting to with this um, particular question, I guess, is trying to think about um, the kind of sustainable angle. And when, like, with regards to gifts, I would say, you know, you, you're talking, you could, you, it could be made with all different kinds of materials, but certainly things like packaging, it's absolutely kind of classic trying to think that through. Paper and card is one of the most widely um discarded um materials and you know one of the things we've looked at here we haven't actually purchased yet but um uh, things like a chipper and like thinking about packaging materials thinking about um the way that things are packaged so that the at the end when the product arrives whatever the product is made of that the, the whole kind of uh process um, you're looking at each different kind of aspect of the uh, of the um, the journey, if you like. Um, I don't know if anyone else has got any other kind of points specifically about gifts and merchandise merchandising. Um, and if not, if we haven't got any specific points I on think, that, I think <clears throat> uh, one aspect of um, diversifying how how we perceive gifts is uh, looking at its format. And we can give physical gifts, but we can also give gifts of knowledge and software packages. So I think for this um, particular person who's asked the question, you know, having a, a full look, a, a good look at the type of gifts that we can give. So you can give time, you can give one-to-ones, you can give ideas on how to make the items that you essentially would be giving as gifts. There are so many different ways. I mean, I'm not talking necessarily about YouTube tutorials, you know, which are about millions out there, but we could look at a DIY kit. And that just basically comes in a email format. And that's a gift in itself, that knowledge. So yeah, loads of different ways to, to create a gift idea. I've got a little follow up to that, um, that uh, which with a nice little story, um, a local park, a, a, a lovely, um, I think it was an elm tree that fell recently. And so you've got a fallen tree in a local park and we have to think kind of permanently about increasing our, like our overall revenue, but also just like how we make the most of things. And I think this is something that feeds through so much about this, this space. The elm tree fell, uh, it was diced up into uh, um, small pieces. Uh, initially, there was a bench created by um, someone who had spotted it 
um, fallen and decided they wanted to, to do something with it. We then thought, okay, this is there's still lots of wood left over. So what can we do here? So um, what we've been thinking about is um, other makers that can create products from that fallen tree. We've got some uh, small tables and some chopping boards are all being lined up to be created with the, the remains of the timber. We're then looking at auctioning those products uh, at, at a dinner that we'll host at the Remakery. We've been having some really fantastic supper clubs here, surplus food and um, the, the food is taken from, from Borough Market. Um, we have a, a lovely dinner with the, with the food. And then we have um, a collection uh, of money which go towards our waste um, and recycling workshops. And, um, and then there would be an auction of the, the products and then that money would then go to run workshops for the local community. So you can see a whole kind of stepped series of, uh, of ideas there that help to move um, a perfectly well, a fantastic, lovely old tree um, uh, to lots of um, lots of skill, re like skilling people up, and giving people new new skills and um, yes. products and um, and things for people to purchase. There's just a few kind of ideas there, and I've, we've got another question here. Um, <clears throat> thank you for sharing your great stories. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, did either of you, uh, any of you have a business plan ready before starting conversations with the council? Um, I think, Dennis, could we have a, a little point on that? Or, or, um, or Phil, maybe? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, for me, no, um, I didn't have a business plan initially. For me, a lot of it through the journey was a lot of um, trial and error. Um, I always think it's important to... Um, take a step first and then start going through the details in terms of um, actually the documentation side of things. I think uh, for me personally, um, it's, a, it's a stopping block if you always want to go through the documentation side of things first. I think you've always got to make an attempt. Um, that's the most important part. Trial and error from my experience has probably been the best learner for me. Just making an attempt at things, reevaluating it afterwards, and looking at the steps that you can take um, to better it moving forward. So initially, I did not have a business plan. Once the conversation started having, then I started running around developing documentation for those discussions. But if I did not take the step or try to delay and start writing documents before having a conversation, I probably wouldn't even be having the first um, meeting with them. So I feel like first get yourself in there, then start working towards what they're asking for in terms of documentation. So that's how I've learned from the process. But I think that's the best step, in my opinion, moving forward for any enterprise you're looking to look into. Um, uh, we, we've got a, a message about a breakout room, um, but I'm just going to see if we can sneak in uh, a question um, about um, what impact do uh, does do we think that um, starting a sustainably orientated business in a collective co-working space instead of an instead of an individual kind of premises has had on us individually or for, or for our kind of businesses. Um, and if we if we if we drop into the breakout room during this question, then that's um, that's uh, that's fine. We'll, we'll maybe we can can continue then. But has anyone got any points, Michelle? A little think, point about I the co-working. I think one word is accountability. We are a co-op and we are a community, and just like any family, you have a common thread that pulls you through. And our our thread is to you know be sustainable um, and to love our environment. And if we start throwing things out that could otherwise be reused and one of our co-op um, members are there, we're going to have a conversation before that happens. So yeah, accountability. If I was on my own, I wouldn't have anyone to bounce these ideas off or to seek advice from. 
So it's, it's invaluable. It's invaluable. I'm going to I'm going to chuck one more thing in. I think yeah, I prior to working here, I was a filmmaker, and I think I'm massively inspired as like as a as a filmmaker. I'm massively inspired by the story, but much more than the story because a story can be wrapped up and kind of um, it, it, you know you can go to the cinema and you can watch a film and you can feel like you've seen something and explored something and just quite sometimes you know not really think much more but for me a story is about what's next and that for me is the most important thing we here are a group of people this space will we hope will continue to evolve over a period of time and where, where this place is in 10 years time and how it supports the community is not for me to say or really for any of us necessarily to say it's it's, it's something that should evolve and um, and hopefully through this kind of conversation and all kinds of other conversations that happen here, all of that process will keep moving forwards and we will continue to keep asking what next and, um, and bringing uh, joy and kind of positivity to each other in the process of it. Um, we're starting to kind of wrap up here. I think um, is is the breakout room is that um, a separate uh, thing? So, uh, maybe that someone can give us some insight into that. But um, we yeah, can. And I'm not sure. Can you can you can you hear me there? Can you hear me there, um, Mark? Yes. Yeah, Mark. Really, I mean, amazing to hear from you all there. I just want to say a huge, huge thanks to yourself. It was amazing hearing from yourself. Wonderful hearing from Dennis. Michelle and Philip, so much to think about. And it's quite ironic. I'm just down the road from you. So I'm very, very keen to find out more about the Maker and all of your businesses. Really, really, really inspiring stuff. I just want to thank you so much for, for just sharing so much of the insight and giving us so many ideas about not just about running sustainable businesses, um, but how we can run businesses full stop and how we can use our gifts and our talents and how we can also think about what it is that we're buying and what it is that we're consuming. So just want to say a huge thanks to all of you continue doing the, the great work and um, that you're doing and supporting each other as business owners. And I hope to visit you all soon. I need to, I've been starting following you all on social media, but huge thanks to the, to the whole team there.